Welcome to the Hockey Writers Maple Leafs Lounge, a weekly show from our Toronto Maple Leafs writing crew, bringing you the latest news, rumors, trades, player grades, prospects, and much more. From training camp to the playoffs, from draft day to the trade deadline, our team covers everything that happens with the blue and white. Come on in and pull up a chair. Welcome to the Maple Leafs Lounge. Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Maple Leafs Lounge. I am your host, Alex Hodgson, here with Peter Barracchini, who was at the draft in person on Thursday and Friday. He was there getting quotes from the newest members of Leafland, uh, also taking in the chaos that went down right from the first overall pick, and I think that's something that we all expected. So uh, we're going to be talking a little bit about the draft in this episode and helping you guys get to know uh, some of the newest Leafs a little bit better. But first, of course... This week's show is being brought to you by The Morning Skate, a daily newsletter delivered to your inbox Monday to Friday, jam-packed with the best hockey stuff on the planet. It is a daily dose of the latest NHL news, rumors, history, funnies, quizzes, everything you could ask for. Just a little hockey fun and information brought to you every day of the week from The Hockey Writers. You will see a link in the show description below. All right, so on to the NHL draft. Um, So, Peter, obviously the Leafs coming into this draft, they only had three picks which was the same as they only had three picks last year. They ended up making pretty good with those picks, um, adding Matthew Nyes, who I would say is their best prospect now. So um, Kyle Dubas has never been shy about trading down into the second round in the past before and trading Mm -hmm. down to get more picks in general. Um, But the way he traded into the second round was a little unconventional this time around. Instead of taking, you know, the first round pick and, uh, and uh, getting more prospects in, or sorry, more picks in the second round, the trade actually involved dumping the first round pick and Peter Mrazek. So I think a lot of people were, were kind of iffy on this trade because on the forefront, it looks like, Hey, the Leafs had to get rid uh, they had to get rid of a first round pick to trade Peter Mrazek. And I mean, if, it, 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 if you look at it, yes, that is what it looks like, but I want to get your, I want to get your take on this trade. Do you think it was the right move to make? Yeah, I was actually gearing up to see who the Maple Leafs would take with that 25th because, you know, there are a lot of options. Owen Beck, Yuri Kulic, um, you know, uh, Jager Furkus, a lot of high-end names that the Maple Leafs could have, you know, looked at taking that 25th pick. But as we saw, Frank Cervalli tweeted out, um, even a lot of the media members when we were looking at it, we were saying, yeah, you know what? It's, it is unconventional because, you know, the fact that you have to give up a first round pick just to move back into the second. But I think he wanted to do that. He didn't have a second. He only had the third to do that and shed off Peter Morales's contract. It needed to be done. I don't think there's any way around it. Um, when you have that kind of a contract, 3.8 million after the season that he had, where a lot of the faith just started to disappear. Um, the injuries, the inconsistencies, it just mounted up. And you know what? The fact that they unloaded that, According to Cap Friendly, they have 10.2 million in projected cap space heading into free agency right now. So that is definitely going to help them out if the, and when they choose to sign Jack Campbell to maybe that $5 million that he is asking for. Because at this point, who would you rather have Peter Morazic at 3.8 and lose Jack Campbell or Jack Campbell at 5 million and no Peter Morazic? And I think that had to be done, even though it costed them the first. I probably would have, I, if you didn't have the Peter Morazic situation, you would have held on to that first, but to, to trade that off, to get the second and an early second at that, to get the player that they wanted, I think it was a really great move and shows that, yeah, Dubas made him made a mistake with the signing. It didn't quite work out, but he's shown in past history to resolve the situation. Although the move may not have been, you know, exactly on point, he got out of it. And I think that's what makes him such a great GM. Yeah. And you know what? We're, we're pro Dubas on here, and obviously there are always yeah. going to be people who disagree, and that's totally fine. Um, but I think it is important to, to address that Dubas did make a mistake here. Mm-hmm. And, you know, as, as, as good of a GM as he can be, and as much as I personally think he's done more good than bad since he's been with the Leafs, he does make his mistakes. And um, Mrazek was certainly a big one. But the one thing about the Mrazek signing is that I think the risk of his health was known going into last season. Everybody knows that or everybody knew at the time that Mrazek, you know, isn't always the most durable. He's had injury issues in the past that have come Mm -hmm. back to bite him. But I don't think anybody could have predicted him playing the worst hockey of his career when he was healthy. And I think that's in front of a beta or behind a better Maple Leafs team with the defense. Mm -hmm, Exactly. Yeah. And you know, you look at, 
you, you look at his performance last year and he wasn't good at all. And I just think it's one of those things where you, you knew about the injury history coming in. You knew about the risks that were there that did present themselves in the end, but he played like some of the worst hockey he's ever played in his entire career last year. And that's something that you can't really fault to GM for not being able to for, for C in my opinion. Um, but that doesn't take away from the mistake that he made. And I think it, um, I, I think in the end, another thing that you can look at is the fact that he didn't double down on this mistake because mm. sure. You can look at that trade and say, Hey, Dubas had to give up his 25th overall pick and move down to 38th overall just to get out of Mrazek's contract. Yeah. But at the same time, he also did free up the near four million of space that he previously committed last year. And if you ask me, I would have rather him have done that than take that four million and keep Morazic, put him in next season, and expect him to rebound. Because Morazic is a good goalie. I don't think that last year really proved how bad he was, or like really uh, did him justice in terms of where his skill is. I think that I think he more more than likely will rebound depending on where he goes after this year. But at the same time, I don't think that's a gamble that the Leafs should have taken. And I'm glad Dubas didn't double down on that mistake. Mm -hmm. So moving on to the actual picks. So as I said, the Leafs traded down from 25th overall down to 38th overall. And I think this was a good draft to do it in because there are a lot of prospects who went in the second round who very obviously could have gone in the first and that's that's not not really anything new we've seen that happen with drafts in the past so I think there was a lot of fluidity between say the 20th pick and maybe the 50th pick something like that there were a lot of guys that could have gone anywhere so on draft day on day two Kyle Dubas selected Frazier Minton from the Kamloops Blazers of the WHL he's seen as a good two-way center a guy who's uh had a solid offensive season. He had 55 points in 67 games. Also worth noting that he was sort of sheltered on that team because he was a teammate of Logan Stankoven, who was a uh, pick of the Dallas stars last year, led the team in points by a mile. Uh, he was the second line center on the team behind Caden bank here. I think I pronounced that correctly. So there's possible, there's a possibility that Minton's got more to show in terms of the upside. So, Peter, uh, what, what are your takes on the Minton pick, and what did you gather from interviewing him at the, at the draft, and uh, what do you think there is there? Yeah, I, I, getting the sense with Minton, Minton uh, he's a very, you know, very, very well-spoken, very well-spoken, very determined, very, you know, open kind of player. And, you know, there, everyone's going to talk about, you know, how they probably could have taken Paul Lewinsky, Noah Warren, Julian Lutz, Luca Delbo Blues, all players that I had on my radar, but I think there's a lot of untapped potential with Minton. And when I got from I before I started anything, I didn't even know this know this, but he was a classically trained piano player for ten years. So that is a good uh, bit of tidbit info for those that want to look up on Fraser Minton. Um, what I got talking with him is he's very excited. He's very. Um, he, he likes to pride himself on being a smart hockey player. And that was the one thing that he talked about and what the Maple Leafs did at the combine showing players clips of certain scenarios of what they would do in that situation. And obviously they must've liked what Minton had said during the interviews. Otherwise they wouldn't have drafted them. They want smart players. They want two way players. He has the ability to, you know, get into the middle of the ice and score a goal. Um, sometimes he, even when the shot isn't great, he does find a way to get it on that and generate rebounds and second scoring opportunities. So he has that smarts. He has that awareness to throw the puck on it and take the shot when he needs to. He doesn't bat, like, you know, take a step back or anything like that. And even when dealing with pressure too, he doesn't um, falter. He doesn't panic. He's always calm and composed. And I think that's what really stood out for him. And the one thing that I took from that interview was he, he wants to better himself. That's the main important thing with, uh, with Minton. Um, he talked about how, you know, he's got like he can constantly got better throughout the season. He wants to take that next step. He doesn't feel that he's ready to jump into the Maple Leafs organization right now, given the depth that they have with the roster, Matthews, Marner, etc. And he even said that, you know, he's come a long way. He wants to get stronger. He wants to get faster. He wants to be more confident. And, you know, the playoffs helped that, but he's got a lot more time. Uh, during his, the remaining years of his junior career in AHL. So he's in no rush. He wants to better himself. And I think that's the most important thing that fans should take away from. 
Yeah, and I think another important thing to note is that the Leafs have very, very slim prospect depth at the center position, Mm -hmm. which I think makes this pick a lot better. um, Not Molden Howard, sorry, that's the next guy we're talking about. Uh, Frazier Minton is a a good two-way center, and I think there's definitely some upside there that could result in him being a second line center. Um, I I think that's more of a ceiling for him than a floor, but when you look at what the Leafs have working at center right now, obviously Austin Matthews, and you have to imagine they'll shell out whatever amount of money it takes to keep him in Toronto, but you know, John Tavares isn't going to be in Toronto forever. And the Leafs are eventually going to have to look to somebody to fill that gap behind Matthews. And, you know, I'm not saying Minton will be that guy, but, he's got the two way game. He's got the speed. He's got the, he's got the drive and the energy. He's got the physicality and he's got some size and some size and some potential, Mm -hmm. uh, potential upside there. So I think he's a guy that the Leafs could work on and he could eventually take over that role. And one more thing, uh, I can think of one other Leafs player in the past. who was also a classically trained pianist. You know who that is? Uh, I probably not. No Leo Komarov. That is right. Oh my yeah. God. There is a, I can't. if you haven't seen to anybody watching right now, if you haven't seen yeah. that video, I strongly encourage you to go look it up. Um, so moving on to the, uh, to the second pick the Leafs made in this draft, uh, Nick Moldenhauer, local boy born in Mississauga, Ontario. He's playing for the Chicago steel of the USHL, which the Leafs obviously have some ties to that organization. Um, 43 points in 41 games, which is pretty similar to what Matthew Nyes had last year. I think Nyes had 44 and 42 or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's been chatter that Moldenhauer might have dropped more than he should have because of an injury that he had earlier this year. And um, there might be some, like we've used this term a bunch, but there might be even more untapped potential there for, for Nick Moldenhauer. So Peter, you talked to him as well. What did you take away from that interview? Again, he prides himself on being a smart player. Um, the way that he sees the ice, the way that he reads his teammates and feeds off them, providing great support. And we even saw a glimpse of that at the U18 tournament. Obviously, there was a lot of bright side, aside from Bedard, Fantilli, Owen Pickering, with that Team Canada team. But I thought an underrated player and contributor was Nick Boldenhauer. Um really stood out in terms of his aggression, his ability to drive the play, his ability to get on the four check. He had, and again, we, we, we talked about this with Minton, his compete drive and work ethic is there. And I think it's only going to get better. And I think the familiarity is already there given how Ryan Hardy, who was recently promoted to assistant general manager was GM of the team of the uh, Chicago steel. When Molden Howard was there, despite, you know, it being a short time, he has some familiarity there. And I think that's really important in regards to, you know, getting the foot in the door and especially in a big market like the Toronto to get that familiarity, to get that comfortable aspect going. Um, the fact that he has a motor, he has that drive. I think it's going to go well for him. Um, obviously, I, I, you, you mentioned the injury at the beginning of the season. Yeah, it impacted his play. And also the reason why he went to the uh, steel is because the missed COVID season. That, that, that had a big impact on him, had a big impact on a lot of players. And despite him only playing in, you know, six games in 2020, 21, two assists, he managed to take a major step forward this season despite limited games. So I think the upside is definitely there. They see a lot of uh, great aspects and, you know, the type of play that they want to envision going forward with this team. And, you know, what, that was a great selection in that third round. And if there was, a, like, you know, any targets for third round, I probably would have taken Nick Moldenhauer if he was available. I was hoping for, uh, for Vincent's roar personally. I, yeah. and unfortunately he ended up going mm-hmm. to the rivals in the Montreal Canadians, <laughs> but you know what, uh, as long as he gets an opportunity and uh, I think, I think everything will be all right. And that's not a slight against Moldenhauer at all. I think Moldenhauer is a great pick in the third round. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you are right on one thing when you say that the Leafs do love their players with high hockey IQ. Um, there's an obvious trend there. Rasmus yeah. Sandin, that was one of his biggest traits in 2018. Um, Topi Nimala, when the Leafs drafted yeah. him, he was originally drafted because of his defensive awareness and his IQ for his age. And he ended up mm-hmm. having a huge breakout offensive season. Matthew Nyes, you know, just these guys that don't really make a lot of mistakes. I think that's a valuable trait to have when you're very early in your hockey career. And hopefully the Leafs development team makes uh, brings out the best in them. Um, we don't know where, where Moldenhauer is playing next year, do we? Is he going back to the USHL or is he committed to a school? Uh, he hasn't committed to a school just yet. He's still evaluating his options, but I think if he does choose, uh, it, it, it's, it's probably going to be closer to, I think. I haven't heard anything yet if he's returning to the steel, 
but college, he definitely wanted to go the college route. That is for sure. Fair enough. All right. Um, so now we'll move on to the last three picks and there, there's a little bit of unfamiliarity with these guys, obviously, as there normally is when, when you talk about guys drafted in the late rounds. But um, one thing I didn't mention about that third round pick is that um, Mol- the pick that was used to select Moldenhauer was actually a result of a trade down. So Dubas yeah. traded 79 into, I believe it was 95 and um, pick number 122, which is where the Leafs drafted this next guy, Dennis Hildeby. He is a, uh, or Hildeby. I, I'm going to say Hildeby. I think it's Hildeby. <laughs> um, Dennis Hildeby, a monster goalie out of Sweden, six foot six, 234 pounds. Uh, he's an overager. He's 20 years old, but he had some pretty impressive stats and a little bit of a breakout year in Sweden this year. Um, they then went on to draft uh, Brandon Lazowski in the seventh round. And uh, I can't, uh, it's Nikita something. The name is Grabenkin. escaping here. Nabeek, sorry. Nikita Nikita Grabankin. Okay, perfect. There we go. So, Peter, tell us what you know about these three prospects here, and uh, do you think the Leafs got some good value uh, with these three players? Um, Yeah, I mean, given how, you know, the later rounds, you really can't quite decide who's going to go where, how they're going to pan out, but I think they got some possible... Uh, you know, depth pieces that can make a strong impact. He'll, you mentioned Hildeby's numbers. He had a phenomenal season, um, both at the J20 level and at the SHL. Identical save percentage, although he had five more games in the J20. But for seven games, 931 save percentage and 193 goals against average in the SHL. That's no laughing matter because the SHL is a really top and competitive league. So for him to come in um, as, you know, overage prospect in the, uh, in the draft, but, you know, uh, getting that experience at the senior level is a really great sign and step forward for him. And I think um, Nick, Nick Richards over at Dauber prospect said that the, that's probably the main reason why the Maple Leafs went for him because of that experience. And he's already further in his development compared to other goaltenders in this draft. And that's a fair assessment. Uh, Grabenkin. Um, I know that there was a comment by Wes Clark who is the um, director of amateur director scouting? Of, I yeah, yeah, director of amateur scouting. He called Grabenkin as a machine like type of player. Hmm. And usually you, you don't hear the word machine like with the Toronto Maple Leafs. You always hear high in skill, mobility, smarts, and everything like that. But the fact that they have sort of that physical presence, that playmaking winger. Um, played on the same team as uh, Danilo Yurov, which um, I think the Maple Leafs were in on if they kept their pick as well for 25th overall, if he continued to drop. Um, so there's that familiarity right there. And he's a really steady playmaker, great puck skills, great control, great speed. And he's, and he has that tenacious factor to get another four check. So again, Minton has size, Nice has size, Grabank and size, and they all bring a specific aspect to the team that'll make them better. And Lazowski, I honestly like this pick. I had him as, you know, an early fourth rounder. And I honestly think he, I get a lot of Ty Void vibes with this pick. Um, smaller player, you know, obviously Ty Void was in a different scenario. He dropped to the, I believe the sixth round because of the no OHL season. But I think Lazowski dropped because of his size factor, you know, both smaller players, but Lazowski has a really wicked release, not the best skating, obviously that could be worked on, but I get the sense that he's going to have a breakout year. So in his post draft year, similar to that of what void had. And that's where I'm getting the similarities where the upside is there, the potential to break out is there and it could lead to something better. And also there's the factor that he could also grow into size a little bit more, add a few more inches, a few more pounds, a few more muscle. So I think I really like that selection. Again, I had him as a fourth rounder. He probably dropped further than he should have, but it worked out for the Maple Leafs because I, I really like Lazowski. Yeah, I think out of those three picks, the one that I'm most excited about is definitely Hildeby. Uh, just yeah. because I, I, I was saying earlier that, you know, in previous drafts, we've seen, for example, last year, Sebastian Kosa went in the first round. Um, the year before it was Yaroslav Askarov went in the first round the year before that it was Spencer Knights. Mm-hmm. And um, had there been a goalie this year that was good enough to go in the first round, this is the year that I would have been totally comfortable with the Leafs taking a swing at one in the first yeah. round. And they did. But with this year being a weak class for a weak draft class for goalies, I didn't expect them to go after a goalie, but they managed to find one in, in Hildeby. And, you know, I think there are a lot of long-term projects out there. You know, Ar- Ar- Artur Aktiyamov, I think, might have some potential. Same mm-hmm. with La- uh, Vyacheslav Paxa or Pexa. Um, problem is, is that both of those guys are, you know, they're probably three, four, five years away from, yeah. from 
even mm-hmm. sniffing the NHL. Um, Joseph Wall and Eric Schalgren both have potential, but uh, you know, there hasn't really been a, a, a game changer of a goalie that the Leafs have drafted mm-hmm. in the system in a long time. And I'm not saying he'll be, will be that guy, but I think his frame is very enticing. And I think the fact that he had that breakout season in Sweden this year is going to, is going to help him going forward. And I'm really excited to see how he does in Sweden this year, because I think he's a guy that could jump the, uh, he could jump the uh, prospect rankings, at least on the goalie front for the Leafs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 6'6", 234, definitely nothing to see out. He take, he fills out the net really, really well. And also the injuries that Joseph Wall has had, that Ian Scott has had, there's a lot of uncertainty with the goaltending prospects that we have. I mean, there, there's no doubt about that. Any goalie that you could get is obviously, you're hoping that there's going to be a turn of events where maybe the injury bug won't hit them and that they develop properly. And I think Hildeby has that potential, but then again, who knows? But they, they've drafted like Joseph Wall and Ian Scott were fantastic players in their junior career. Like that was the right move to make. It's just post draft and their development. It's, it's hit a curve as a result of that. Hopefully this could change their fortune because unfortunately Wall and Scott were great. It's just, they haven't had that taken. They haven't been able to take that next step, but hopefully Hill to be can sh- serve as some reassurance there. Mm-hmm. And I think the uh, bringing in, uh, Curtis Sanford as the new goalie coach might have, yeah. might help with that too. Steve Breer has been here for a while and, no, I, I, I mean, it's kind of hard to, for me and for any of us to judge a goalie coach's performance mm-hmm. because we're not the ones working with them. But, you know, it's safe to say that things have been less than flattering on the goaltending front for the most part for the Leafs yeah. over the past couple of years. So uh, interested to see how those guys uh, um, develop under Curtis Sanford, who's worked with guys like Thatcher Demko in the past. So that does it for uh, this edition of the Maple Leafs Lounge. Don't forget that the show is brought to you by Morning Skates, a daily newsletter delivered to your inbox Monday to Friday, jam-packed with the best hockey stuff on the planet. It is a daily dose of the latest NHL news, rumors, history, funnies, quizzes, et cetera, et cetera. Just a little hockey fun and information brought to you every day of the week from the hockey writers. You will see a link in the show description below. Once again, thank you so much for tuning in. I am Alex Hobson here with Peter Barracchini, and we will chat with you next time on the Maple Leafs Lounge.